Hi, and welcome back to SEO On Air, a weekly podcast where SEO experts and agency owners talk about their in-field experience building online brands. We talk about transformation and the innovations that led them to success. I'm your host, Aaron from Stan Ventures, an SEO agency focused on boosting rankings, increasing traffic, and improving brand visibility. Today, we're joined by Catfish Comstock, the director of SEO at Business Online. He provides solutions to some of the biggest and most prolific business-to-business and enterprise-level companies. He's also presented SEO best practices at the Online Marketing Summit, Clicks, as well as the Popcorn Conference. We talk about the history of SEO, thought leadership, account-based marketing, and much more. Here's how it went. You mentioned that to do something for 20 years is um, something great uh, until you kind of lose a bit of touch in it. Um, but you've been doing SEO around for 18 years plus, I think, more than that, I think, right? Well, for this company, I've been coming up on 18 years. But yeah, right. I started around, I want to say 1998. Um, okay. I got a job. I, I had previously worked in guitar stores for about seven years coming out of college. Um, and in fact, I studied computer science in college, but I got so enamored with music and and guitar that I ended up taking a job at Guitar Center and then another local shop in San Diego called Guitar Trader. And I kind of bounced between those two shops for for seven years, selling guitars and pro audio stuff and, and guitar accessories. And that's what um, that's what really gave me the opportunity to become a professional musician because I was around the industry. I got a huge education, not just from an industry perspective, but from a guitar playing perspective because I was around other great guitar players basically 24 seven. And so after that period of time was over and I was looking for something new to do, I got, uh, I randomly got a job at an internet service provider that was selling 33 K and 56 K dial up service, uh, you know, back, back in the day as a customer. And, uh, I had a lot of time between phone calls i was outreach so i was just calling people proactively to make sure that their service was working because back then you know a lot of people had problems with their tcp ip settings right to get their modem to work correctly yeah Uh, i was gonna say that for me i feel completely like a newborn here because um i i think around the time 1998 i was maybe let's say four years old yeah so i remember dial up i remember modem but i don't the entire scene is completely new to me. Yeah, it was a different world, man. And, um, you know, at the time, I didn't know very much about computer stuff at, at all because it had been a long time since I studied computers in college and obviously things had changed. I mean, I I originally learned on um, on a Unix mainframe using VI as my editor and I didn't have a mouse because there wasn't such a thing. So, yeah. you know, it was a completely different world. And um, but I had a lot of time between phone calls, calling people up and asking them if their service was okay. And that's when I decided, hey, I want to build a website for my band. You know, websites were pretty new at the time. And so uh, I found a site called htmlgoodies.com and learned how to program HTML in my spare time between calls and ended up making a website for my band and then figured out that nobody was coming to hear my band play. <laughs> and so... Uh, that's when I discovered SEO. I discovered a program called Web Position, uh, which was a, a, a ranking, a rank check program, basically. Uh, and uh, just started really getting into SEO. And, and I figured out one day that if I took a page that was already ranking in AltaVista, because that was kind of the biggest search engine at the time, there wasn't even, Google wasn't a thing yet. Um if I took a page that uh, was already ranking for dog food, for example, and I went into that page and I replaced every instance of the word dog food with free MP3. And then I went back and replaced every other word in the document with a different word that was relevant to MP3, but made it all make sense, obviously. But uh, in other words, kept the same relative percentages (laughs) and the relative layout of the page that I could rank well for that keyword. I mean, that was literally... SEO in the very beginning. That was like a different version of um, keyword research. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it was a sort of a combination of keyword research, landing page development, and um, and basically copying your neighbor's work. And so, much, yeah. uh, you know, but it worked. And um, eventually I ended up outranking mp3.com on Alta Vista for the word mp3 with a site Which I is- had called heavymusic.com and of course mp3s were the big thing at that point in time yeah so that got me a job where um for my neighbor 
uh, who had a baby site. And that's when Google first started. And uh, I ended up getting him ranked in the top five for baby cribs and, and baby strollers and, and this kind of stuff. And that uh, that got me a job in La Jolla, California, working for a billionaire who owned some hotels and some travel sites. And uh, he sent me to my first SEO conference up in Los Angeles. And literally the first person I ever met in the world of SEO was Bruce Clay. Um, who, you know, you may know as the father of SEO, I believe is, is the moniker that he typically goes by. And of course, Bruce is a legend in the industry. He's been doing it, you know, at a high level, even longer than I have. And I was very fortunate to make Bruce's acquaintance at that show. Uh, and we've been friends ever since. And uh, I've been, you know, really fortunate since then to you know, speak at, at some shows with him. I did a lot of speaking from when I first got the job at BOL, 2005. I, I started speaking a lot, actually more than 2006. And then up until we um, we won the uh, HP account sometime, I think in 2011, 2012. So that six year period, I did a lot of speaking nationally at like SES and OMS and uh, various Upcon, other Upcon, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then once we got the once we got the HP account, I was in charge basically of uh, SEO globally for for Hewlett Packard, and then by extension when they split Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So uh, that was basically a full time job in and of itself, and and I sort of got out of the thought leadership game to make sure that I was servicing that client, which was a once in a lifetime opportunity. But um, you know that I learned just a ton um in my experience doing that and i had the opportunity to to travel to china for a week and um educate folks out there about baidu best practices so i got to visit uh you know shanghai and um beijing so uh yeah it's been it's been an incredible um opportunity that i've had at, at uh bol so i've been very fortunate very blessed to you know to do what i do one question i'd like to ask is how have things changed from the let's see early 2000s to now? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, when I was working for the guy in La Jolla, right, the whole thing was reciprocal links, right? So we we were using our list to create um, reciprocal link directories of of relevant um, uh, relevant sites. And so in order to get ranked for Las Vegas hotels, um, I did a lot of reciprocal links with Las Vegas sites. And then I did a lot of reciprocal links with hotels outside of Las Vegas. And so the combination of that Las Vegas link connectivity and that hotel link connectivity really powered the travel site that I was working on to, to get listed. Um, and of course, you know, that that was the early days of sort of page rank and, um, you know, the pay, uh, reading the page rank algorithm and understanding how that worked and uh, you know, pay attention, paying attention to the page rank bar whenever it updated and, and all of these kinds of things. So that's definitely one area that's changed a lot over the years is that even though links are still a big part of um, the, the ranking algorithm, there's a ton of other stuff. And really, in, in the last two or three years, the intent of your content uh, and um, and the ability of your content to meet the needs of the average person that's looking for your content has really become a, a huge part of uh, Google's ranking algorithm. And uh, I think that's a that's one of a number of huge changes that have been um, that have occurred since since the early days of you know 2005, 2006. Were there any, let's say evergreen practices that you saw that still remain true today? Yeah, I think so. I've been I've been fortunate at BOL to always um, ever since I got to Business Online, um, my CEO, Thad Kalo, the first thing that he said to me when I got the job there was that we wanted to be aggressive in getting results for our clients. But the number one rule that we always want to follow is mitigate risk and ensure that anything that we're doing ladders to user experience best practices and ladders to SEO best practices. And this is 2005. So that was certainly not the way a lot of folks were, were doing SEO. Um, and for example, we've, as a company, we have never purchased any links for any client since I've been with the company. 
That's just been something that we don't do because, you know, there you you may remember uh, if you've been in this industry for a long time. The um, uh, was I forget if it was IBM or or who it was, but there was a really big company that got popped for links at one point. And uh, apologies to IBM if that wasn't them. Um, <laughs> we will blur it out. I, I'm, I'm spacing on the exact name right now, but but that's the exact reason why is like we don't want to do anything that puts our clients at risk from a much larger problem than a few keywords dropping on any given month. And um, so we've always been um, focused on techniques and tactics that lend themselves to good user experience. And I think the good news there for us is, is that as Google has matured and as their technology has matured, they're in a better position to reward those tactics now than they were when we first adopted them, you know, a, a long time ago. So that's been really cool to see. I think one of the big changes too is, um, well, from the early days, obviously not having keyword data, right? The um, not provided was a, was a big deal. Um, and it's still sort of a big deal. Um, I remember the day that not provided happened. I was, uh, I think I told you this in our, in our pre-interview, I was speaking at an SEO clarity event yeah, and yeah. I, the day that I had a presentation that was co- that was completely focused around keyword data and you and leveraging keyword data, uh, I woke up to find out that everything I was going to talk about that day was no longer was no longer valid. So we had to do a little bit of a tap dance uh, that day. Revised uh, everything. How, how yeah, did you everything. go about that? Um, we just we just started brainstorming. I, I was on a panel with Laura Beatty and. Um, uh, Benj uh, Ariola and uh, you know M- uh, Middle from SEO Clarity, uh, who's been one of my one of my great friends in the SEO industry since I think 2006. I've been working with SEO Clarity. Um, we sort of did some brainstorming, uh, you know, on the fly before the session, and talked about some of the various um, ways that uh, we would have to adapt to this new world. Um, and we were fully transparent and saying, hey, this is <laughs> this is sort of a, a, a new uh, paradigm, uh, a new universe that we all live in. And so here's our early thoughts on what we're going to need to do to survive. Uh, and that that's, you know, I think that's really uh, indicative of the industry that we live in, right? Like on any given day, yeah. Google can decide to change the rules. Um, and sometimes they do. So you've got to be um, you've got to be one of those people that embraces change, um, that is excited about change and is excited about constantly learning new things uh, in order to, uh, you know, in order to be successful. Embracing change is something that I'm kind of glad you brought up because around, I think, maybe 12 years ago, and I'm sorry if you're if um, you don't remember this link because I think that happened last time as well. But you did an, um, a little slideshow presentation on the value of SEO. I mean, the value of SEO on social media. Yeah. So I was going to ask. Uh, I mean, technically, since there's always a changing aspect of um, social media and how it was once upon a time with just text and MySpace to now just like what five to 10 second clips of videos and maybe a little bit of narration. So how did you navigate that in 12 years ago? And how do you see things have changed now? Well, I think to your point, 12 years ago, it it was a lot less crowded of a field in terms of where you needed to be. Right. Um, And, and also I think that, um, what you were capable of doing on social media back then was completely different than what you're capable of doing now because uh, consumer behavior um, and just audience behavior in general was completely different. Social media has become such a huge part of everybody's life, uh, you know, today, whereas back then it was not nearly what it is now. Um, Back then, I think that we primarily thought of social media as a, a an amplification system for content. Um, and uh, especially at that time, um, you know, and, and it still remains to this day to be this way, but using social media to promote assets that might generate links um, was one of the, you know, the best uses for social media. 
there wasn't really anything nowadays you know you get tweets that will rank and and other social posts that will rank in search results right so that changes the equation a little bit on on your strategy there because now you want to make sure that you're um that you're infusing keyword focused language into your social media interactions so that you can potentially you know uh in, enjoy the um the opportunity to get ranked with those things but i think back then it was a lot about um using social promotion uh to help with link building and then obviously blogging um which has always been sort of considered sort of social media i think even more so back in the day when blogging mm -hmm. first started right it was more of a social sort of thing than it is now um not that it's still not now, but I think it, it, there's just a different feel about blogging than there was in the early days. Excuse me. And um, I think that producing blog content um, that aligns to uh, target keywords on a consistent basis and uh, creating thought leadership um, content that really resonates in the industry, I think that that's was then and is still today one of the biggest uh, aspects of leveraging social media from an SEO perspective. Thought leadership content is pretty interesting also because I feel a lot of people um, might assume they know what it means, but don't really know what exactly we're talking about. So if you could just maybe give a little bit of a, just an introduction to what it is, and then I can ask a bit more questions on that later. Yeah, well, I think that um, thought leadership content really is is content where you're showcasing expertise in in your field, and um, either explaining things in a way that it, that adds value to the current conversation that's online, that that are it's based on your experience, um, not just your prognostication, um, but that it uh, you know that it fills a gap, right? You're not just repeating. Uh, the same stuff. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have, like, for example, uh, a definitional page about terms in the industry that are important to you. I, that's a kind of, that kind of content is actually performing really well in search right now. But ultimately, if you want to set yourself apart as a thought leader, you've got to be speaking to other folks who are thought leaders, um, which means that you got to come to the table with that something that really um, adds value to the conversation. And I think that uh, in, in the early days when I was doing a lot of speaking uh, and finding success at generating new clients and doing that, uh, you know, on the on the SEO circuit, so to speak, I was complementing that with a lot of, of thought leadership blog content that that was um, complementing whatever it was I, I happened to be speaking about at that time. And I remember um, and it, it sort of dovetails into ABM a little bit because when we pitched the the HP account, um, you know, so many years ago, uh, I remember two weeks before we went uh, down to, I believe it was Houston, to uh, do the pre the final presentation to the team down there. I wrote a blog piece um, that was published in, I want to say, Search Engine Watch, uh, that basically was the top ten top ten things that enterprise SEO. Uh, uh, that that should be part of your uh, enterprise SEO program, and I did that with the hope that it would showcase expertise on the topic um, that would uh, you know maybe make its way back to HP. And I was uh, literally one of the one of the um, the most memorable moments of my life in terms of SEO was walking into the room and sitting down next to somebody from HP. And they were closing a binder and I saw a printout of my article in their binder when they were closing it. And so it was literally like you couldn't have asked for a better, uh, you know, a better set of circumstances. And yeah, I it felt, was almost movie like. Yeah, it was almost movie like it really was. And um, but it, it really underscores the value of, of thought leadership, not just for positioning your 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 company's brand and your personal brand in the space, which is always valuable. Um, but it can really resonate with potential clients. Um, and it, again, it, it, I think in this business, there's so much um, misinformation. And if I'm being truthful, there's a lot of folks out there that are um, that are trying to oversell their experience, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, 
um, as a consu- as a consumer uh, looking for an SEO agency or an SEO consultant, it can be a very challenging situation to, you know, figure out who's the best fit for your organization. And so, uh, as a as an SEO practitioner trying to get that business, the more that you can do to demonstrate expertise, and the more that you can do. Um, to uh, exhibit your experience in a way that that m- makes folks feel comfortable in doing business with you, I think the, the better off you're going to be. I think um, because you kind of uh, broke it down to two concepts of as an agency practitioner and the, um, as a, let's say, customer. Um, how, I'll, I'll ask one question at a time, I think. So as a, the a- SEO agency uh, practitioner, uh, when would you advise um, them to start creating uh, thought leadership content, or is there a certain amount of time that, or should you, can, or can you just start whenever you want to? Well, I think one of the challenges that um, that companies have is uh, a reluctance to, uh, in some cases, attribute authors to the content that they're making. Right? They they publish content and they do it under the company name. And that undercuts um, the value of that content as it relates to building a a personal brand for your your authors and your speakers. And and I get it. It's a little bit of a slippery slope because if then you build somebody up and then they leave your company, it's obviously lost equity. But at the same time, it's been my experience that um, people, when when people are buying a, a B2B service or a B2B product that's dependent upon the expertise of the people at the company, they're they're really buying that um, th- that whole entity, including the person, right? And so I think that uh, uh, it's really important if you're especially a, a service agency to develop the personal brand of the people that work at your agency so that um, that when when people, uh, interact with your agency, they're also excited about working with those folks. I think that goes a long way in, in helping um, to make a case that your agency stands out a, a, above the rest. But in terms of when folks should start building thought leadership content, I think that yesterday would be a great time to start, right? Like you, you should be consistently and constantly putting out thought leadership content that differentiates you in the space. Um, and I think that, you know, there's all kinds of considerations there in terms of what your budget is, what's, what space are you trying to break into? Where does that content fall in the funnel? Is it, is it top level content? One of the, one of the dichotomies of, of SEO right now, as it relates to content marketing is that a lot of top of the funnel content is what tends to rank for broad competitive you know, marquee keywords that folks are going after, right? Yeah. And uh, the content that people usually budget for is the content that's lower in the funnel that they can attribute ROI to because it pulls in leads. And so balancing that mix of content within your marketing budget um, it, it is a challenge. And I think for SEO, we, at least based on the way the landscape is right now, um, we can help make the case that thought leadership content actually does end up being really valuable. The the missing link there is, is once they get to that content, you've got to be doing, uh, you know, constant conversion testing uh, and uh, putting out additional content that speaks to the subset of the people that come in on the generic content so you can pull them deeper into your funnel because you're going to get a lot of visitors that are not your potential clients and that's fine. You're still, you know, creating brand recognition within the space but you've got to be able to be really good at taking people who are coming in off a, a, a you know a, a high level search and they're landing on your top of the funnel content you've got to maximize the throughput to the next level of your of your customer journey and so you've got to create um, a second level of compelling content that speaks directly to those folks and then you've got to position it on your site in such a way that you're getting a, a good click through rate and a, a good engagement rate I think the the second part to that kind of question would be, um, as a customer, how do I determine whether the thought leadership content or the just the content that I'm reading 
is as not as genuine as it is or maybe it's exaggerated content what are the signs yeah. i could tell to tell it apart i mean that's a really difficult question because uh you know it's like in, in music some of the best guitar players that that uh that live today are people that you've never heard of right yeah. right and so um some of the best seos in the world are people that you've never heard of and they don't yet have that recognition and they're they're you know, maybe in some cases just trying to publish their first few um, pieces and they could be great, um, great folks to work with. Um, but to your point, if, if you don't really understand anything about SEO and you're trying to gauge who's who, that can be a very difficult road to to go down. So I would say that, um, you know, certainly I think being in the industry for, you um, you know, any kind of significant period of time is a helpful indicator that somebody might know what they're talking about. I'm not saying that, you know, you can't be a good SEO um, after only doing this for a little while, but the longer that you've been in the industry, the more things that you've seen change and the more clients that you've worked with, the broader base of experiences you have to pull from to be able to solve problems for, for new clients. Because, um, that's a lot about what SEO is, is problem solving, right? It's understanding yeah. the landscape. It's understanding the tools that, that are at your um, disposal. And it's about coming up with the best possible solution for a client given that, that set. So uh, I think that the more somebody has experience in doing that and the more clients that they've worked on um, that are similar to the business that you're involved with, the better off, uh, the, the, the better the chances are that they're going to be able to help you. Okay, because I I don't think listeners are that let's say oblivious to what's going on in the SEO and digital marketing world, but I do feel like if you are trying to get into that field and maybe acquire services or take the help of other people, you should know at least the bare minimum of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, if somebody's right now out there trying to get involved with with SEO and they're trying to become an SEO expert or an expert and they're trying to do SEO for a living and get involved in the, in the industry, I would really recommend that at a bare minimum, you start with your own website and maybe just create like an affiliate site um, and and, uh, and learn what how to do that and what that's all about. Um, do it on WordPress because a lot of people use WordPress. So if you're familiar with WordPress and you can do SEO on WordPress, um, that lends itself to, you know, getting customers if you're just starting out. So uh, you want to, you don't want to learn on your customer's dime, right? You, you want to really have the knowledge in hand to be able to help somebody when they agree to pay you money to do that. So uh, the best thing to do is to get that experience is to one, start your own site Two, everybody's got a friend with a website that needs SEO help. Like, yeah. you know, they're not that hard to find. So you may want to do some volunteer work for some folks um, uh, for SEO. And then in, in exchange, um, once you've created some kind of meaningful uptick in their traffic, um, that they would be willing to give a testimonial to you and then that you could use their, their logo on your site as a, as a customer even though they're not paying you to do that. But if you're the one that's generating the results, they're, they're still basically, uh, you know, I don't think there's anything um, uh, morally wrong with calling them your customer. As long as you're producing, as long as you're really doing the work and you're producing the results, right? Yeah, it so, still counts. Yeah, and, you know, if, if somebody's, if, if you're doing it um, basically to get your feet wet and to get experience, then nobody's paying you to take those risks. So, I feel like that's a, a better situation for both parties because you're not representing yourself in a way that says, hey, I know what I'm doing. Pay me money to help you. Yeah. Right. If you don't know what you're doing yet, then, you know, bite the bullet um, and and get that experience. And then when you've got a couple of those and you've got your own website and you can legitimately say that you know how to help somebody, then uh, you feel a lot more justified in, in, you know, taking money from somebody to do that. Yeah, I feel that's fair enough to um, assume that. But um, to kind of cut it off and jump back to something you mentioned earlier, um, you spoke about account-based marketing and how business online is something um, offers that as a service, I believe. Yeah, I mean, we're a, a full-service digital agency. So organic search, paid search, display, 
creative uh, analytics, MarTech consulting. But uh, one of the things that we specialize in is account-based marketing. So account-based marketing is a little bit different than traditional demand gen in the sense that you predefine what accounts you're trying to market to and acquire uh, as customers. So with demand gen, you're putting stuff out there, you're trying to attract people, and you're hoping that when they get to your website, um, that they will interact with you in a way that eventually leads them to be your client. Uh, and you don't know who those people are uh, initially when you, when you put out this material. It's like casting a net into the sea and hoping that you get some fish when you bring the net in. Account-based marketing is more like having a spear gun where you're looking at the fish that you want and you're trying to get that particular fish. Uh, and so... Um, there's a whole lot that goes into that. And uh, for anybody that's unfamiliar with account-based marketing, you might want to look up, uh, you know, what is ABM in Google, the HubSpot page, I think they come up, you know, in the top three uh, is a really good place to start. But essentially, um, you know, you, you create an ideal client profile. In other words, who is it that we're going after? And then based on that profile, you define what's our target account list that, that matches that, right? And so um, once you have that target account list, that becomes the lens with which you place value on interactions. That becomes the lens with which you say, we're going to make content specifically for this group of folks. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a much more complicated conversation to have because it, it requires a huge shift in thinking and, um, the big difference is, is that the value of the traffic that you're looking at, um, it becomes a completely different conversation because you might get much less traffic doing that, but the traffic is much more valuable because it's all qualified. So we, uh, we have an offshoot of account-based marketing, ABM, we call AB SEO, which is account-based SEO. Yeah. And what account-based SEO really is, is again, um, having the measurement system in place or the feedback loop in place from your CRM back to your analytics, um, especially if you're using GA4 uh, and potentially uh, an ABM tool like Sixth Sense um, or something of that nature that allows you to be able to look at SEO performance specifically as it relates to what are the target accounts that you're going after, how, how what does their search footprint look like, and how do I use that data to really place a, a, a heavier value on that activity and let that data color my strategy going forward. In other words, I might be getting a bunch of traffic to this page over here, but that traffic is not pulling in or interacting with any of the accounts that I'm going after. Whereas this page over here is not getting that much traffic, but the traffic it is getting is completely targeted to the people that I'm trying to talk to. So um, obviously that, uh, you know, that knowledge and that ability to uh, prioritize uh, activities against changes the way that, that you approach SEO and it changes some of the initiatives that you might do based, based on that knowledge. 